Hello, and welcome to another installment of FIT Talks, the oral history program of the Fashion Institute of Technology, one of 64 campuses of the State University of New York. I'm James Ferguson, Special Collections Associate and Curator for the College Archives. We're coming to you today from the FIT campus on West 27th Street and 7th Avenue in Manhattan. It is April 25th, 2023, and the time is 12 noon Eastern time. I have the honor and privilege to be joined today by Professor Michelle Handelman of the Film, Media, and Performing Arts Department. Professor Handelman, welcome to the program and thank you for participating. Absolutely. So, first of all, for context, would you please tell researchers a little about your childhood and your upbringing? Oh my God. <laughs> well, where can I start? So I guess I will start at the very beginning. I was born in 1960 on the south side of Chicago. My parents were middle class Jews who also grew up on the south side of Chicago and were our high school sweethearts. So that was fine and dandy for a few years. I was the youngest of three children. So I am kind of, you know, at the edge of the boomer generation, as they say. I feel like I have much more in common with Gen X than boomer, but I was, you know, I was influenced by the political activism that was going on during the 1960s and the 1970s at that time, though I wasn't quite old enough to really participate in it. So we moved to the suburbs, the nice, boring, white suburbs of Chicago in the mid-60s. And that was when everything started to blow open uh, with the counterculture and politically across the country. And that's when my parents' marriage blew open as well. And so from that point forward, from about 1970, my father took the counterculture path lived on the road, became politi politically active, hit the road, ended up in California, ran a massage parlor, sold drugs, ended up moving up to Northern California and becoming a pot grower in the mid 70s, <laughs> totally veered off from his you know, middle class upbringing where he was a traveling salesman driving around the Midwest selling power tools. So at that time, my mother went the opposite direction and stayed in her suburban abode and continued to marry up the ladder and marry into the upper class cultural elite of Chicago and ended up with an art dealer whose name was B.C. Holland, who was a great tastemaker in Chicago during the late 70s and the 80s. And so I grew up kind of the, a child who is a perfect mix of both of them. I learned how to live underground. I, you know, I was, I was doing deals for my dad. I was, you know, an underage, precocious adventurer for half of my time. And then the other half of my time, I was going to school, I was doing my homework, I was getting pretty good grades, I was expanding on my creative practice in some way. And, um, you know, and I was thinking about education really at that time. But I was very anti-institution as well. And so that really molded me, both of those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I love this question. <laughs> because I do have two things I remember. One, which I think every little kid wants to be, is I want to be an actress. I want to, like have those spotlights. I want to be special. I think that that's what that was because I was also terribly shy and I was not a performer. I was not a stage kid at all. But the other thing that I remember that I always wanted to be that was the most important thing to me was to be a flight attendant. 
<laughs> that was my ultimate dream. Really, as a little kid, you know, by the time I became a teenager, I had different dreams. But as a little kid, I wanted to be a flight attendant so I could travel the world and see everything and meet people from all over the world. I hated living in suburbia. I hated it so much. All I wanted to do was get out and meet people from everywhere. All right, well, what, what is your formal ed education and your informal education <laughs> for that matter? Yeah, well, my informal education was certainly spending time with my dad. That was quite an education. And um, my dad was also very influential, as wild as he was and as decadent as he was. He was also a man of integrity and he you know, taught me from a very early age to treat everyone with respect, no matter what class they were, what race they were, where they came from, to stand up for what you believed in. And he also taught me to do whatever I wanted to do. You know, like to follow my own path and make my own life and not just follow something that society was telling me to do. And I know this is probably the answer to one of the later questions. <laughs> That's okay. But um, also my informal education was getting involved in club life. Back in the early 80s, I worked at nightclubs for years and years and years. I lived for music and for being out all night. And that taught me so much about also about adventure, but about also about, you know, finding out who you are and being who you are and celebrating who you are and finding out where your limits are and how far you're willing to take it. So my formal education was actually just as complicated as my informal education. I started out going to college right after high school at Hampshire College which I ch chose because number one, I wasn't gonna go to any college that had frats or sororities. That was a number one choice. Number two, I was very anti-institution, anti-grades, and at that moment in time, there was this renaissance happening in higher education, and Hampshire College was one of the schools that was leading that renaissance because you didn't get grades, you actually weren't required to take any courses, uh, theoretically, and so it seemed like the ideal place for me to go to school. And at that point in time, I wanted to be either a archaeologist or a civil rights attorney. I was really interested in ancient history, and then of course, you know, fighting the good fight. So I ended up going to Hampshire. I had tragedy my first year. My stepfather, whom I was very, very close with, died, and I just lost my way. And I ended up there for a couple of years, not really doing much of anything. I ended up going to school in London for one semester, doing even less, <laughs> but um, hanging out in London, 1980, I remember it very specifically because it was the year Reagan got elected. It was the first year I could vote, and so I voted absentee ballot, and it was also the year John Lennon got shot. So it wasn't exactly a good time to be an American in London. Um, so I, you know, I'll never forget that day when Reagan got elected, though. I bought every newspaper I could find in England and spread it out all over my floor of my little bed set and, you know, just started stomping on, mm -hmm. <laughs> stomping on the newspapers. And, you know, you say these things, I'm never going back, I'm never going back, which we say kind of every four years. Uh, but then you do, and then you move on. So I came back, didn't know what I was going to do. Then I ended up going to the School of the Art Institute, because I went back home to Chicago. I ended up going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for two years, studying photography, 
But as I was simultaneously, 1980, also starting to work at this club and spending way more time at the club than in my classes and didn't graduate from there either and dropped out after two years. And then eventually, a few, I don't know, in 86, I guess, I moved to San Francisco. And that was a point in time where I was like, I can't do the club life anymore. I'm going to die if I keep doing this. I want to be a serious artist. And so I moved to San Francisco because one of my best friends from my first year at college lived there. And my dad, of course, was out there. And then um, I ended up starting to make performances and short experimental films. And so I was renting a 16 millimeter camera and realized, you know, I could probably get this equipment for free if I go to school. And at that point, I decided to go back to school to the San Francisco Art Institute. And it was there I actually got my BFA 10 years after I started college uh, in film. And I studied with the great late George Kuchar, um, which was such a gift. And then many years later, I started teaching by, quite by accident. And I made a feature length documentary film called Blood Sisters, Leather Dykes and Sadomasochism. And it took off, it was a big hit when it came out. And I started to get a lot of attention all of a sudden. And so for the first time, someone asked me to teach a class that was also at the San Francisco Art Institute. So, so I was like, sure, I'll try this. Up until that point, and I really hadn't been doing anything legal to make money. And I, because like my dad taught me, don't get locked up in some job or do anything that society tells you to do. Your time is valuable. So I started teach this one, teaching this one class and realized I really liked it and thought, wow, okay, so this is great. I can make money doing something I love because what I'm doing is I'm just talking about work that I love. I've actually been very fortunate in all of my like 25 years of teaching that I've always taught courses that I've designed. I've never stepped in and taught some class that someone else wrote or that I didn't want to teach. So that I, I like that and I realized, okay, this is, this is something I could do. I see myself here in the future. And it was something I never imagined. Like I never went to college thinking, oh yeah, I'll be a professor at some point in time. And as I said, I was very, very anti the institution because I still, firmly believe institutions kill creativity, they kill the individual. Um, yeah, it's a real, and it's a real challenge and always is working within an institution. So I decided I various things happened and I was going to move to New York full time. And I've always loved New York and I've been dying to move here since I was 18 years old. And finally, it was the right time to do that. And I realized that I liked teaching so much and that I wanted to take it seriously. And I knew I had to get a master's degree in order to get a serious full-time teaching position. So at that point in time, I went to the Bard MFA program. And I think I was 38 years old when I started there. And that's where I got my master's. All right. So now you might have covered this. I, I was going to ask what your first job is, but let's say your first jobs, legal, illegal, take a pick. Uh, um, well, I guess my first job was illegal because I would carry packages for my dad mm -hmm. to other people and he would give me something for doing that. But my first legal job, and this was around the same time, was working at an Italian ice place at the mall in suburban Chicago. And I lied about my age to get the job. I was 14, but I, I just, I always wanted to be an adult. 
You know, like I, I always just wanted to be an adult. I wanted to be on my own. And if I made my own money, that was like freedom. I could spend it however I wanted to because it was my money. So I got the job at the Italian <laughs> ice place. And then after that, I got several other jobs in retail at the same mall, kind of worked my way around the mall. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got into waitressing because that was a place where you could make a lot of money, but not have to work nine to five. The whole goal was never to work a nine to five job ever. And I've succeeded. Here I am. Yeah. And yeah, I succeeded on that one. So. Um, and then I became a bartender for many, many years until teaching. All right. And how did you decide on your career or maybe how did it decide on you? Yeah, it definitely decided on me. And I mean, I already told you about teaching and how I fell into that. Mm -hmm. But even just being an artist, it... For me, it was a long process, and it was a process of elimination. I really wanted to be an archaeologist. I ended up going on this archaeological dig in Campsville, Illinois, where they were digging. It was through Northwestern University. It was my last year in high school, and um, we were digging up Native American runes. And I was so excited to go there and be this junior archaeologist. And I remember going there having this really conflicted time because I started to meet some of the Native people who actually still lived in this town who were not happy we were digging up their mounds. And through these conversations, I just understood how complicated this world was and how um, not hypocritical, but just compromising to be involved in this. On the one hand, the research is important, but on the other hand, w how are you affecting people's culture and lives who have been here long before you have? And so I could never sit with that. That made me very uncomfortable. So that's when yeah. I decided, no, I can't be an archaeologist. Then it was to seriously be a civil rights attorney, and I started to work this was also before college, at this consumer activist organization in Chicago called Call for Action, which was a hotline. It was a radio show with a hotline, and the people would call in with their problems, and our office, which was just me and the woman who ran the radio show, would s solve their problems, and they were consumer problems like, I bought this through the mail, I never got it sent back, sent to me, this company owes me money, you know, it was kind of like the pop culture form of the Better Business Bureau, mm -hmm. and, which we dealt with a lot. And um, through that, I got to experience the frustration that civil rights attorneys must feel in terms of both, on both ends, you know, both trying to right the wrong, but also having these repeat, these people come back over and over again who forgot to like save a copy of the check or do the things that are just you know responsible things to do so when you get screwed later on you have some recourse and so that was just you know early on that was something that just frustrated me so much and I felt like if I keep doing this I'm just going to be depressed the rest of my life because this is really depressing and so threw that off the table. Then went to college, my stepfather died, so then I, you know, I just kind of wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then when I ended up back at, or at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I went into the photography department because I always had a camera throughout, like from the time I was 10. I was always taking photos. I was really into photography, but I never thought of it as being something I would do seriously. So I went into the photo department, and um, you know, even though I mainly was spending my time at the clubs, I did do a fair amount of work that inspired me in some way. And I just started to follow that, and then thought I would own a club, and then I would get like more invested in the club world, 
because I had managed a club at some point. And then when I realized, no, this is not the way for me to go, I just kind of, you know, drifted out to San Francisco and knew I just needed to start shooting things. So it was really a long process of elimination before I got to the point where I was like, oh yeah, this is what I do. And then, a while later, how did you come to work for FIT? Oh, that's an interesting story. I answered an ad. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just answered an ad. And bless the goddess, I got this job. I was a full-time tenured professor at Mass Art in Boston. Mm -hmm. But I commuted there. And I had been commuting there for seven years. So every Monday morning, I would get on the Amtrak, and then I would come home late Wednesday night. And I hated Boston. I didn't want to move to Boston. I needed the, I had reached a point in my life where I just needed the security of health insurance and a full-time position. And I got it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to commute. This is what people do. So I was doing that, and I was really reaching the end of my rope. Especially the winters are insane. You get stuck on a train for like five hours in the snow, and they can't move. Um, and I just was like, I can't take this anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'm just going to have to quit. And then I saw the ad for the job here at FIT. And I almost didn't apply because I thought, well, it's really fashion focused and that's not what I do. But I, you know, I would love a full time position in New York City. So I applied for the job and then I realized, well, this is a whole new program and it's not going to be fashion focused. It's an independent filmmaking program. And I got really excited and here I am. I got the job came here and then my first year was spent really developing. Some courses had already been written. I wrote a few more courses um, and then started to lay the groundwork along with my colleague Bill Mooney to really develop the space, the equipment, everything. And then the second year I was here which was the 20, I started 2013, 2014 school year, and then the second year was 2014, 2015, and that's when we brought in our first cohort. All right. What experiences stand out most for you during the 10 years here at FIT? Wow, there's, yeah, that's a hard question. Um, you know, what stands out to me the most mm -hmm. was that first year when I found myself in a boardroom with a bunch of architects, a bunch of media people, the IT people here, the head of IT, the head of buildings and grounds, Sherry Brabham, the head of finance, I believe, these architects, and me. And I wasn't, ex that wasn't exactly what I signed up for. <laughs> I thought I'd just be like developing courses and teaching. And I discovered that they were all looking to me to lead them. Like, how many rooms do we need? What size should they be? What sort of equipment should be in them? How, you know, how should these chairs be designed? And I'll never forget that shock. And that, that kind of went on for a whole summer of really being challenged with something that I had never done before, nor had I expected that I was going to be doing. So I wasn't really prepared for it either. But I had been teaching for, I don't know, at least you know 18 years at that point. So I was able to just sort of know, oh, we're going to need this, and we're going to need that, and we'll need this. Um, but that was astounding to me. It was a big, because that was the whole reno of our little wing. And the dean wasn't there. Bill was like, well, I don't really know because I'm a film historian, not a filmmaker. So it was just me. 
And that was powerful, and it, yeah. it worked out pretty well. You know, there were a couple things I changed, of course, but. Yeah. Lo and behold, you come to FIT and you discover you were a designer. Uh, I oh, know. Um, but also, another thing that I really loved, especially when I first came here, is I worked with the museum. And I worked with Valerie to put on a handful of film screenings that went along with the shows that they were putting up. And I love that because that was, I love the museum here and that was one of my really, it, one of the things that excited me the most about coming to teach here was that I could have a relationship with Valerie in the museum. And we put on a screening of Charles Atlas's films to go along with an exhibition that they had about mm -hmm. fashion and dance. And that was a packed, sold out screening and Charlie came and that was a real highlight. Yeah, that was terrific. I yeah. Um, which person or persons would you say has had the most positive influence on your life? Well, as I said earlier, I think, you know, my father really taught me a lot about integrity. And um, I also had this professor at San Francisco, the School of the Art Institute in San Francisco. Or no, the San Francisco Art Institute. I get their names all mixed up. And I can't remember his name right now. He was this experiment this weird animated animation experimental filmmaker and I took one class with him and I remember he told me he like made a point of coming up to me for some reason to tell me what you want doesn't exist you have to make it that, you know, there's no road out there that's got your name on it and that's waiting for you. And that was one of the most inspiring things mm -hmm. someone had told me. But, uh, you know, I've gotten, I've been blessed to have a few good mentors in my life. Um, aside from living mentors, what, um can you think of a book or film or other work of art that has influenced you the most? Oh my God, that question. I mean, to think of one is I impossible. Yes, Sophie's choice. <laughs> impossible. Pick a couple. I mean, so many. Okay, Fellini films, number one. I and mean, these are the things that I'm going to pick that like impacted me before the age of 18. So Fellini films, silent horror films, Nosferatu, um, St. Joan of Arc by Carl Dreyer, which was not a horror film, but that impacted me so deeply. Uh, Hitchcock's The Birds. I mean, I still see the aesthetics within all of these films in my work now. Mm -hmm. And I know, oh, that came from when I watched The Birds when I was six years old. Like, mm -hmm. I remember that, just the style and how it impacted me so much. Um, the very early 1930s, 1940s classic f horror films of Frankenstein, The Mummy, Dracula, all of those films imprinted on me as mm -hmm. well, deeply. And then I would say the earliest poetry that really impacted me was Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Artaud. And then a little bit like in my early 20s was when I really got turned on to Pasolini. And Pasolini's writing along with his films really mm -hmm. impacted me. All right. Moving from past to future, what are your future plans or dreams? Wow. I mean, that's a big question. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, my future plans, mm -hmm. that's a little bit easier. Yeah. My future plans are right now I'm working on a brand new project 
which is called delirium and it'll end up being a large multi-screen installation and I just shot my first section of it which is a rumination on death and I shot it with the performer Lydia Lunch no wave icon and that went really well we shot last week so my plans are to continue shooting this i have some other people in mind which i'm not going to mention yet because nothing's locked down um and and i also have plans to go to japan at the end of the year and i've never been mm -hmm. so i'm continuing my childhood dream <laughs> of traveling around the world and you know really my big dreams it's significant right now because I'm quitting full-time teaching and I've been doing this for almost 25 years I think and I'm just going to be free again in that sense and so my dreams are really to expand my life in many ways that I don't even know about now I want to surprise myself what would you most like for people to remember about you here at FIT in general? That's a really hard question. Uh, I've been thinking about this and I think, I mean, I want people to remember me as being a kind person, but also someone with an extreme sense of integrity, someone who lived who walk the walk or walk the talk, however that goes, talk the walk, walk the talk, all someone who talking. is always true to their convictions and always stood up for what they believed in. Because um, to, to me that is the most important thing. And I also would like people to remember, if, if, if they're remembering me or thinking about me, that I tried really hard to put out in the world work that would move people in some way and inspire them in some way. Not in any spe specific way, but just mm -hmm. impact them in some way. Nice, lovely. And then finally, what questions didn't I ask? Oh my God. That you wish I had. Yeah, I, well, I think these are good questions, Great. very good questions. I don't know if there's anything else. I hope, I mean, considering where this interview is sitting, I really do hope, it's been, it's been really exciting and very challenging to start a brand new program from scratch. And that is something I had never done before. I had taught many different programs but I'd never started anything from scratch. And it was really a dream. And I thought that Bill and I really were a good combo and we're so different from one another. But we ended up complimenting each other and I think we made a really strong program. And so I really just hope that FIT continues to support this program, that they can support it in even bigger ways than they are supporting it now and that FIT will continue to expand and grow from a position of really encouraging extreme radical creative practice that's out of the box because everyone who teaches here is ready to do that. And so I hope the institution will just let people expand in the biggest way they can. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle Handelman. Yeah, well, thank you. It's been a great 10 years. <laughs> I can't believe it's been 10 years, which some, in some ways, you know, when you're this old, it doesn't even seem that long, 10 years. But um, it's been great being here with you. Likewise. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.